Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me today in Romans chapter number 15. I don't know if there are certain words that you love to hear, words that to you just never grow old. In fact, the title of our message today is simply that, words that never grow old. Now, there are some that are common, some that you probably were taught from your mother's knee from a very early age. In fact, before you could remember or fully understood language, you heard the words that I suspect for many still never grow old. They're the words, I love you. And from the right person at the right time, those are words that are timeless words. They just never grow old. You probably were told again at your mother's knee that there are words that are always appropriate. And and those would be the words, thank you for some kindness that's been shown to you. We like other words that are a little bit more casual and yet they're always welcome. Words like good job, hey, you finally finished, or congratulations, you finally passed. They're just words that we look for and listen to, and they're meaningful words. They're words that in some way, shape, or form, they never grow old. The man's name is R.A. Torrey. Uh, Reuben is what his mother would have called him, not R.A., And Reuben was a young man who learned about the love of God from an early age. His dad was a successful businessman, but later, even while Reuben was still at home, lost everything that he had. In fact, when when his inheritance was given out, his parents died at at a rather early age or in his young adult life. Uh, Reuben received a matchbox and a couple shirt pins as his only inheritance. But he did understand that there was a God that was to be addressed and a God that could be known and a God that wanted him to know about. So Reuben learned that from, again, a very early age. It was in 1875 when Reuben was a student at Yale University living a life that was in rejection to the truths that he had learned as a child. In fact, Reuben Archer was living a lifestyle that was clearly in defiance, and he knew it. And Reuben felt rather comfortable with the life he had chosen. Clearly a life in defiance to God, but a life that he thought, what else do I need? I have everything that I want. I have fun. I have friends. I have whatever I want. Why do I need God? And yet there was a mother back home who continued to pray for young Reuben. One night while he's living in the middle of this defiance, he pillowed his head and in the middle of the night, Reuben had a dream that his mother had come to him pleading with Reuben to give his life to Christ and submit himself to the work of preaching the gospel. In the middle of the night, Reuben woke with a start and then at that moment, the real battle began, the battle for his soul. And so Reuben begins at the middle of the night to sense this incredible pull, one for the life that he was currently living, and the other the life for which his mom was praying. The battle became so intense that middle of the night time that Reuben thought the only way to bring this battle to its conclusion is to end his own life. And that was what Reuben intended to do. R.A. Torrey intended now, as a young man of 18 years of age at this point, he intended, I'm going I'm to end my life because I don't want to face the battle. He went to his wash basin to look for his razor and by the grace of God could not find it. 
He searched for some other instrument, fumbling about, still unable to find some vessel to do the deed. And then Reuben concluded, I have no other means but to call upon God to rid me of the struggle. And that he did that night. Reuben, there in his room, in the intensity of the struggle, simply calls out to God and surrenders his life to him. At that moment, Reuben Archer Torrey looks back and says, that was the moment that I came to Jesus Christ. Shortly thereafter, at a chapel at Yale University, Reuben publicly identified himself as a follower of Jesus Christ. And from that time on, Reuben Archer Torrey, R.A. Torrey's life, was radically altered. He became a vessel, a mouthpiece for Jesus Christ. One of the things that Tory did is Tory began to write in prolific terms regarding prayer. He was a man that knew how to get a hold of God. In fact, if you look up one of the, the titles that he's well known for, How to Pray, you'll find that there are, even in the first chapter, these wonderful principles about prayer. I've just put five of them down in my notes. Listen to what, what Reuben Archer Torrey begins to write about regarding how to pray. Why should we pray? Because there's a devil and prayer is the God-appointed means of resisting him. Why we pray? Because prayer is God's way for us to obtain what we need from him. Why pray? Because prayer is the means that God has appointed for our receiving mercy and obtaining grace to help in time of need. Why pray? Because prayer is the means of obtaining fullness of God's joy. Why pray? Because prayer with thanksgiving in every care and need of life is the means of obtaining freedom from anxiety and peace which passes understanding. Tori preached and lived the life of prayer. He was going to God, asking God for what he needed. Listen to part of Tori's testimony. A number of years ago, Tori wrote, I came to a place where it seemed my duty to give up my salary and work for God among the poor. From that day on, every mouthful came directly from my heavenly father. Not a meal on our tables, not a coat that went on my back, not a dress on my wife's back, nor the clothing on the backs of our four children that was not an answer to prayer. We got everything from God. I was never more serene in my life. I wonder if Tori was especially passionate about prayer because of his own conversion story. That the time when he was calling upon God somehow resonated with him about the necessity of prayer. Do you know one part of Tori's conversion story where that battle was going on was something that came to Tori's awareness shortly after he came to know Christ. When Tori woke up in the middle of the night and that battle in his life begins to ensue, he later found out that in the middle of the night, his own mother was awoken in the middle of her sleep. And Reuben Archer's mom then knelt by her bedside, beginning to call out to God, doing the laborious work of prayer for her son, R.A. Tori. Tori would go on and be instrumental, used of God in ways that he could have never imagined. Uh, D.L. Moody actually reached out to Tori and said, I need some help with the beginning of an institution, Moody Bible Institute. Tori was one of the key instruments in God founding a work that has stood for the proclamation of the gospel for many years. Uh, Tori would later become the president of Moody Bible Institute. 
Tori was so burdened about worldwide revival and for the lost coming to know him that he prayed year after year after year that God would send someone. And finally, someone came knocking on his door and said, would you come to Australia and preach the gospel? That trip to Australia began literally a worldwide campaign where Tori himself saw over 100,000 souls claim Jesus Christ as their own. Why all of this emphasis on prayer? I think it's because there were some words that had never grown tired to a guy like Tory. Words that would have come from his own mother's mouth. I'm praying for you. Your Bibles are open right now to Romans chapter 15. If you would join me for just a moment, Romans chapter 15 beginning in verse number 30. And what we're about to see in this passage of Scripture is something that is intensely personal and intentionally practical. Paul's going to share some things, very practical, things that you and I need to know, but he's also going to get very personal. We're going to get some insights into the life and the mind, the thinking of the Apostle Paul that are recorded for us in the eternal pages of Scripture. Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse number 30, the Bible says the following. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that ye, and take note of these two words, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Do you know the first thing we're going to see in this passage of Scripture is we're we're going to see the agonizing of prayer. The agonizing of prayer. Look at what the Apostle Paul is asking them to do. Now, the, the Holy Spirit's going to insert a word into our passage today that is used in its exact form nowhere else in the entire Bible. Now, we have the two words. It's actually one compound word in the Greek. Our two words are strive together. But the Greek word, again, it's one compound Greek word. Sun agonizomai. Sun agonizomai. Sun, that word means together. So let's do this together. And then it adds agonizomai. Now, you can almost say, I can tell you what that word means even without knowing Greek, agonizomai. He's saying, would you together with me agonize regarding these matters of prayer? Let us strive together. He said, let us together agonize before God regarding these matters of prayer. And you say, well, what does this word agonize mean? It means to fight the adversary. It means to contend, to struggle with, even in difficulty and great danger. So Paul is saying, come on, let's agonize, labor, strive, fight together with me in prayer regarding the matters that are before us. He's saying, I need you to join me in this matter of prayer strive together. Okay, so this summer I had the privilege to speak at a couple different teen camps. One of the camps that I was at was up in Michigan, and they had what what camps have when you're having a great teen camp. They had a wonderful mud pit that was really quite spectacular. And when you looked at that, I mean, it's not just like they didn't just dig a hole. They had this pit, okay? And so it was the slough of despond, all right? So, and they had it filled up, and it was a mucky, muddy mess. It was a wonderful mud pit. And they did all kinds of great games, inner tubes, all kinds of stuff. I mean, if you're in the pit, you are covered in mud. It was a great teen activity. And then you can't have a mud pit without having, you know, this event as well, and that is the tug of war, okay? They had a great tug of war. And you know what I always love? I always love when they get the leaders. Okay, this round is for the leaders. You know, and you got some guy that's, you know, one of the ancient of days, all right? And he comes out, and and he's going to be, and and you know, you always love to see who's on which side, all right? And usually, like if it's the leaders or if it's the teens, do you ever look for, like, you know, you're looking at who's going to anchor the rope, right? 
And usually, if you get some big hulking kind of a guy back there, you know, and he's really big, and, you know, he's back there. And usually they like, I don't know, sometimes they actually tie the rope around them. And they're hunkered in for the long haul. But I'm also looking not just at the big guy at the end of the rope. Because sometimes that big guy can get drugged through the mud just as easily as the guy that's this big right here, okay? So, so you have this big guy that's back there. And then you want to see who else is attached to the rope. Who's pulling with him. And I found over a lot of years of watching tug of wars that it's really not just the big guy at the end of the rope. It is the people who have joined together for something bigger than any one individual. And you know, when you think about God doing some great work on behalf of mankind, how often have we seen People grab hold, so to speak, of the rope. And we know that this is going to be agonizing. I mean, even if you think about it in the physical realm, you watch some people that are on the end of a rope, and it's just for a game. But the toil and the agony, the effort that they are expending to win at that which is before them. And I wonder how many times we have laid our hand to the rope of prayer and partnered with someone else to agonize over that which is before us. In the book of Colossians, Paul sends his greetings to the church, and then he adds greetings from others. One of those guys that he says, hey, so-and-so said to tell you hello. One of those men was a guy by the name of Epaphras. And he says, Epaphras also sends his greeting. And listen to how he communicates these words from Epaphras. He says it this way, verse number 12, Colossians chapter 4. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, listen to these words, always laboring fervently. It's not soon agonizomai, it's simply agonizomai. Do you know what Epaphras is doing, Paul said? He is striving with you. He is laboring on behalf of you. He is lifting your name up before God in prayer. The prophet Isaiah seems to indicate the same idea, that, that he's saying, hey, hey, this is something that has to happen, but there is some, some hint now, not just hint, there is some sadness in what he communicates. Listen to what Isaiah says. Isaiah 64, verse number 7. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. Isaiah is saying, how sad this is. There, there, there aren't any. God, we should be rushing into your presence, taking hold of you. But there are none that are rousing themselves. Do you know, if you want to understand what's the literal meaning behind the word, there are none that take hold of thee. There's none that stirreth himself up. The stirreth himself up is simply that. It's like, hey, hey, wake up, he says. S set an alarm clock. K keep a list. Call upon the name of God. He says, everybody just kind of in this, in this spiritual slumber continues to walk throughout their day, but they don't purposefully rouse themselves from the slumber. Who are you waking up to pray for? Who comes to your mind in the middle of the night when you offer up prayer? Who, when you're doing laundry or driving or working or even playing, who are you pulling on the rope together with on behalf of? Campus Church, we must labor together with one another in the necessary work of prayer. He begins with this agonizing in prayer, but he goes a little bit further and he helps us to have some additional insights. The second thing that we see in our passage before us is what we'll refer to as the ask the ask of prayer. Notice verse number 31 again. Romans 15, verse 31. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. This is his ask. And that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. L listen, Paul is bringing this request to the church at Rome. 
He's saying, okay, there is some agonizing. I'm asking you, will you strive together, agonize with me in prayer? And then he says, here's my ask. This is what I'm asking for you to bring with me before the throne of God. Might I add, prayer always, prayer always demands an answer. Praise doesn't demand an answer. It's simply offering something to God. Worship doesn't demand an answer. It's a recognition of God's worth. But true prayer, real prayer, it is asking God to do something and then it anticipates an answer. If your prayer demands no answer, you haven't yet prayed. What the Apostle Paul does now is he says, okay, labor with me, agonize with me, strive with me, and he says, here's what we're asking. Will you pray with me regarding these matters? And again, Paul's prayer, it is primarily twofold. So he, he takes this down two directions. There's a personal aspect of this prayer. It's very personal. I mentioned that. Romans 15, verse number 30. Notice what he says. Strive together with me in your prayers to God. Now, we might even think it just stops there. But did you notice how he adds to me, for me. Listen, would you go talk to God, strive, labor together with God for me? There's something personal about this. And then verse number 31, he says it again. He says, that I may be delivered. Have you found there is something humbling about asking someone else for help? Something humbling. Um, how many of you are like do-it-yourselfers? You don't want to ask someone else for help. Um, you ever say, no, 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 I can do it. And, or give that here. Let me try that, you know. We want to be the person that, no, no, I don't need any help. And have you ever found it humbling when you find I can't do it? And then you, you finally get to the place where you say, okay, can you help me? There's some humbling aspect to prayer. To going to someone and saying, hey, would you pray for me regarding? And Paul gets personal here. He says that I may be delivered Paul knows what is in front of him. He, he gets this. In Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, he seems to, to almost repeat this idea. With all, he says, praying also for us, that God would open a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in bonds, that I may make manifest as I ought to speak. I, I find this really insightful. Paul is not saying, when he's writing to the church at Colossae, he doesn't say, hey, would you pray about my bonds? I mean, how often would we be praying, hey, I've got this problem, this, this, this challenge of circumstance, and Paul says, hey, listen, I get it that I'm in, in bonds, but would you pray about the advancement of the gospel? Would you come and labor together with me, strive together? Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2, finally, brethren, he says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. And then you can't get any more direct than 1 Thessalonians 5.25. Brethren, pray for us. Pray for us. There is something very personal about his ask. Pray for me, he says. But he goes a little bit further than that. And then he has this protective aspect of his prayer. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe. The word delivered, it just means to rescue. It means to rush to one's aid. Paul's about to go to Jerusalem and he does understand those things that, that he's gonna face there. Doesn't understand it fully, doesn't know all the details, but he knows I'm going to Jerusalem and I know there's something that's awaiting me. He even alludes to this, gives us some insight. Acts 20, verse number 23, the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, every place I go, the Holy Spirit keeps telling me, when you get to Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen. And do you know what Paul's saying to the church at Rome? He's saying, hey, listen, there's some things that, that are going to happen. Would you pray for me? He's asking the church at Rome for him to be delivered. Have you ever done this before? Have you ever been with someone who is unaware of their circumstances and you reached out and saved them, so to speak, from some kind of peril? Have you ever had something like that happen? Have you ever been standing at an intersection? I mean, people today, I, of course, we're on our phones a lot. So we're looking at our phone. Have you ever reached out and grabbed someone who is about to walk into an intersection to some peril? Okay. 
Do you know, that is the idea behind the word. I'm, I'm asking you that I may be delivered. The Holy Spirit is telling me there are dangers that lie ahead. I don't know all the dangers. I don't know all that entails, but I do know I have a mission to advance the gospel and I don't want anything to get in the way. Remember, Paul's not saying, I I don't want to be in bonds. I don't want bad things to happen. He bore in his body the marks of his witness for Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying is, would you pray that I'll be delivered from anything that would hinder the furtherance of the gospel? By the way, if you want to do a, a great study in Scripture, study the word, the New Testament word for delivered. Because, you know, it appears to me, I might have missed something, but it appears to me that every time the word delivered is used, it's always used in light of God doing the delivering. And it's always in light of some need that mankind has, that God comes and and he, he intercedes on behalf of man and he delivers man. And how often this happens, as the Apostle Paul says, as, as we call upon God for his deliverance. You see this agonizing aspect of prayer. And then Paul says, okay, if you're going to pray, you're going to have to ask. Here's what I'm asking you to pray with me about before God. And then he wraps this up. And and there is some answer to prayer. Some answer to prayer. He he even shares, "Here's, here's what I am ultimately praying as the answer to the prayer. Look at Romans 15 verse 32 that I may come unto you with joy. And here's what he's framing the answer around. By the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. He's saying, hey, listen, church at Rome, here's here's my ask, pray with me. And here's the answer that I am asking God to deliver, that I may come unto you with joy, by the will of God, and that I with you, that I may with you be refreshed. Paul knows there is one person that can deliver on the ask and provide the answer. He says that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God. The answer to prayer that we are seeking should always be bound to the will of God. And Paul submits himself to it. Even though he knows that bonds and afflictions await, even though he knows there are challenges that lie ahead, even though he's praying for deliverance from anything that may hinder the gospel, he says, God, I I want what you want. In Acts chapter 20, same passage where the, the bonds and afflictions await, same passage, Acts chapter 20, verse number 24, he says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life as dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He says, listen, I know bonds and afflictions await, but would you pray the answer that I'm praying for? I just want to come to you with joy by the will of God. And I know that when I'm together with you, I'm going to with you no matter how I get there. He's going to go in chains to Rome. But no matter how I get there, that I may with you be refreshed. You know, before we go any further, we have to say that every ask, we want to submit the answer to the will of God. There are some things, of course, you don't have to pray about. Some things we already know, that's the will of God or that's not the will of God. He lays that out for us all throughout Scripture. A couple of brief examples. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. There's some things we don't have to pray about. Uh, God, should we live together before we get married? Is that your will? Well, why would we pray about the, the will of God already revealed? 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Those are things that we know are the will of God, but there are some things. It's like, Lord, I don't know what your will is here. For example, James 4 verse number 15, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, 
We shall live and do this or that. Do you know, sometimes it's not just a cop out. We say, hey, Paul said it this way. He said, and this will we do if God permit. Sometimes it's fine for us to say, this is my plan. But man, it's all underneath the answer of God that is connected to the will of God. Paul says that prayer and he prays it repeatedly. You can find if the Lord will, if God will, you'll find that expression all throughout his prayers. Prayer then becomes a surrender of my will to the sovereign God who always retains the right to do what he wants to do with what is his. One of the old evangelists, one of the old preachers, E. Stanley Jones, once wrote it this way. He said, prayer is simply surrender to God. If I throw out a boat hook from a boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but aligning of my will to whatever God wants. That's praying the answer, which is in the will of God. Campus Church, there are some words that never grow old. And the words I'm praying for you rise to that level. They never grow old. When I was five years old, I had a Sunday school teacher whose name was Mrs. Ailing. And when I was, when I was five, I thought she must be, I'm not kidding, I thought she must be 120, okay, she was, she was so old and so lovely. As a five-year-old, I just loved Mrs. Ailing. She became one of those fixtures in our church, always there, very special. I can remember uh, in high school, sometimes we would go over to her house and rake the leaves of her house, and Mrs. Ailing would come out, and, and there she was, my, my kindergarten Sunday school teacher, special lady. After my freshman year of college, I went over to visit with Mrs. Ailing. She lived just a couple blocks from where I grew up. And so I went over to visit her, knocked on her door, and Mrs. Ailing, now 140, okay, Mrs. Ailing comes to the door. And, and when she sees me standing at the door, just like always, her face lights up, as does mine, just to see her. And, and she invited me in, and I came and sat down in, in her her just beautiful old living room, old house, old Mrs. Ailing. And we chatted and talked and she asked about college. And, and then she said something that's the first time I ever remember this being said to me. And Mrs. Ailing looked at me and she said, Jeff, I want you to know, I pray for you every day. And I've never forgotten it. I can remember when the Lord took Mrs. Ailing home. I thought, oh, Lord, who will continue to pray for me? For years, I had the privilege to speak up at a camp here um, connected with Pensacola Christian College. I preached there every summer for multiple weeks. And there was a dear saint, the mother-in-law of Geddes Allen, who is a member here at our church, the mother of Lois Allen, who is now in glory. And Mrs. Kleinpeter, every summer, every day, would say, Jeff, I'm praying for you. I can't tell you how meaningful those words have become to me personally. Who are you striving together with in prayer? Who are you praying for? Make a list, make a list today of those that God is bringing to your heart and mind to pray for and begin immediately to pray. And then if you had one thing, just one thing that you would want someone else to pray about for you, do you know what that would be? Then why not ask? You may be surprised at what you will get in return. You may get some words that will never grow old. I'm praying for you. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. 
Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.